series um, of, medicinal, of mushroom talks I'm doing. This is the first one on medicinal mushrooms. And this is about an hour presentation. Um, so it's gonna really limit the depth that we're gonna be able to get into in terms of the topic. Um, and so I may leave you with more questions, particularly if this is something you've done some studying on, um, but we'll do our best. I wanna thank um, Brenda and the Belfast Free Library. We've had a long partnership. Uh, every other presentation I've done there has been in person, which is my preferred venue, um, but that's not much allowed these days. So it gives me a, a chance to, to organize and do some pres presenting virtually. Um, so I wanna start here. I started getting into medicinal mushrooms, um, oh, probably in the late 1990s. And I, you know, I was reading some of the pop literature, I was kind of looking at it, but I didn't get a lot into it until I had a friend who um, ended up diagnosed with cancer. And she was a coworker and I said, what can I do? How can I help her? What, what am I able to do? And it sparked me to do a lot more research. Um, and from that, I started making some products on my own, um, and I did a lot of the research that went into the first book I wrote. Um, and for me, that's just one of the ways I exercise mushrooms, because for me, that which I am seeking is seeking me. It's, a, it's an excuse to get out into nature. It's an excuse um, and a reason to be out and get in touch with myself. Um, and we're gonna look at mushrooms through that lens. And I am not a clinician of medicinal mushrooms, so I'm gonna be looking at it from the identification and features and that which is known about them. Um, and I'll touch on some of the places that I use them and the people I know use them in their lives. Um, so this is the range we're gonna cover. We're gonna talk a little bit about medicinal mushroom use, the history, uh, uh, quite a bit about how they work in the body, the various compounds that they're known for, um, a little bit about their use worldwide. Um, and then we're gonna dive into the, the common medicinal mushrooms that are frequently here in Maine and, and Northern New England. Um, and then I'm tacking onto that a piece on um, mushrooms as kind of the psychoactive age, the, so the medicinal mushrooms, uh, the medicinal use of some of the psychoactive mushrooms. And then finally, mushrooms as functional food and a little bit about preparation tips and resources. But that's gonna be a lot to cover. So this all started for us in, 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 the, in, in the general culture um, our understanding of medicinal mushrooms came about um, when we started um, recognizing uh, the Iceman. In 1991, there was a, a man whose body was found melting out of a glacier in Europe, up in the Alps between Austria and, and Italy, right near the border. And initially, the people who found him and the authorities thought he was just something, someone who had died recently. And it turned out it was a very well-preserved, you know, 5,000, 5,500-year-old um, corpse of a Neolithic man. And among his possessions were a lot of things. He, had, he was fully dressed. He had a, a bronze as, or a copper axe. He had a bow and arrows. He had a satchel. And in that satchel, there was this mass of felted material. And they didn't know initially what it was, and what they t determined is that it was the tinderconch. Um, in Europe, they call it the amadou. And the Iceman may well have been using this as a tinder, because it has been used to both help start fires as well as to transport fires for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, well, likely thousands of years. Um, in fact, it was commonly used up until um, the sulfur match became more integrated into culture, which is well, really after 1900. But the Amadou, that pounded felt that they found, which would be a great tinder, is also could have been used to bind the wound in the shoulder of the Iceman, which likely led to his death because it's a great anticoagulant, or excuse me, great coagulant as a, as a bandage and has a pretty broad antimicrobial compounds in it. The other mushrooms that he had in his possession was the birch polypore. And you can see these are photographs from the um, Iceman Museum. 
and they were on leather thongs, two chunks of the birch polypore. And normally you see it festooning um, a birch in the fall, usually September into October. Um, and this is an interesting mushroom. It's not classically edible, though there are people who will eat it when it's first coming out. And about the stage you see the youngest ones there. But then it gets quite bitter. And it gets quite bitter because of some of the terpenes in it that are medicinal. Um, and the, one of the common names for the birch polypore is the razor strop fungus. And it's kind of abrasive when it's dried. So he may have been using it to help sharpen his ax, uh, which was fairly soft metal. But it's also broadly antimicrobial. And as they understood more about the body that they found, as they, they delved into it, they realized he was suffering from a lot of intestinal parasites. And the birch polypore taken as a decoction might well have purged some of those parasites out of him. So it sparked our interest in medicinal mushrooms and how they might be used, and people started looking into them. But really, now we're in Western culture looking at them, but how long have they been used? And by far the oldest history of medicinal mushroom use, the records come from China. And in part, that's because that's where we have the longest history of written language and written language that has been um, kept over generations and um, centuries. The Mao monks, the Taoist priests, the bureaucracy in China help preserve things. And it is incredibly mushroom loving, a mycophilic culture. And I was talking to a friend of mine who spent some time in China and she says, you know, hundreds of species, you go into, into the market or into an apothecary and you're just overwhelmed by the number of mushrooms. And the, they likely use maybe 600 different species of mushrooms and what they're using medicinally and what they're using for food, there's a real overlap between the two. Um, likely in that culture, um, 7,000 years of integration of mushrooms as healing tools. Um, in Europe, we know a lot less in part, I need to acknowledge every indigenous culture, if it gets overrun and uh, conquered, we lose a lot of the knowledge base and history that they have. Um, the, in Europe, though we know that some of the uh, indigenous peoples in Siberia and Eurasia had been using some mushrooms for hundreds and hundreds of years, our records go back maybe a thousand years into the Greek and the Roman, again, preserving written language. And from their records, it was difficult to know what species they liked. Um, you know, the, the Romans, the edible mushrooms, they called them all um, bolis, and even the, the guild ones. Um, and for the medicinal mushrooms, they called it agaricum. And later, it came clear that one of the species that they used was Fomatopsis uh, officinalis. And that was known later as the agaricum. Um, and it's still used medicinally. It's in this country, it's pretty rare. Um, you find it in old growth forests in, in the, uh, the west and, and the northwest and up into Canada. Um, I suspect maybe it was in Maine before we um, chopped down all the forests. So, oh, by the way, I want to show this, this photograph here. I, I have this in because this is a, a mushroom uh, growing tree and carving that was in Belfast for many years until it was overrun by the um, artist conch on here and they cut it out. Um, and someone saw a photograph of it. He says, is that Angus King's brother fungus? So I had to put that in there. Um, but other cultures who used, who used and use mushrooms historically and currently, um, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, um, again, along with that history in China, those, those cultures go way back. Um, certain parts and regions of Africa, um, Nigeria, Benin, Algeria, Egypt, um, Meso Mesoamerica, um, Central America, and Southern Mexico, particularly they use psilocybin. A lot of the other ones, I think we may have lost some of that um, understanding. Um, but there's a long history of use of edible and medicinal mushrooms in the Mexican highlands. And that's just a part of some of the list of around the world. But 
I want to dive briefly, as I said, into some of the compounds that are found in medicinal mushrooms that make them value, uh, valuable as health aids. Um, and the photograph here is the Dyer's polypore, which is not a medicinal mushroom, but I just, I love that photograph, so I stuck it in there. <clears throat> that was found up, uh, up in Hancock County about five years ago. So more than anything else, medicinal mushrooms are valued for their ability to boost and to modulate immunity. Most, most mushrooms across the board contain these long chain polysaccharides, chitin and glucans, um, and the medicinal mushrooms we value have a higher concentration of some of those polysaccharides. Um, and they're very large molecules, they're very highly and variably branched, and when we take them into our bodies, when we eat them and they pass through our gut, they're mostly indigestible. They pass through as fiber, but these long chain um, compounds, um, they interact with, the, with our um, immune um, triggers in our gut, um, and they trigger an immune response. Now, in terms of their use medicinally, the glucans and the glycans, they work on a functioning immune system. So for people who might want to use them or might be using them to support uh, uh, treatment for cancers, if you're in the midst of radiation or cancer um, uh, chemotherapy, glucans will not be working while your immune system is knocked down, but before and after they can be quite helpful. So I'm not going to delve a lot into this slide, but they work again on a functioning immune system and they stimulate a number of different factors of, in our immunity. Some of it is the, the roving immunity that goes through our limbic system and our blood. Some of them are, are, are much more targeted. So they stimulate the production and the activity of macrophages, which wander through our bodies um, and consuming uh, both bacteria and virus as well as cancerous cells. They increase the activity of natural killer cells that do the same thing. Um, and they stimulate our white blood cells, our lymphocytes, and they trigger them to begin to mature into the targeted B cells and T cells, which um, will become cytotoxic to malignant cells. They also increase the production and the action of the cytokines, uh, such as interleukin, interferons, those things which are cascading through our bodies. So those are the kinds of things, including um, the stimulating the production of something called tumor necrosis factor. Um, and tumor necrosis factor kind of triggers that kind of cell death in, terminal, terminal, in tumor cells. They call it apoptosis. So that is such, such a kind of a simple explanation, but we're going to need to stick there for tonight. So the use of mushrooms in terms of tumors um, is mostly due to the, the, um, the glucans, and they have been shown in clinical trials and with animal studies um, to slow cancer growth, to shrink, actually shrink cancer tumors. And they've also, we found out, when they're used with more traditional Western medicines like chemotherapy and radiation, they reduce the side effects of that. Um, and I strongly believe in the use of them to assist both in prevention for somebody's at higher risk and also when someone is in remission to prevent the re reoccurrence. So to boost up that immune functioning. Now, those are the ones that are most famous, but there's other kind of active compounds in certain mushrooms that are, that are very helpful as well. Um, including the terpenes and triterpenes, and those are especially uh, common and concentrated in the different species of Ganoderma, like the artist conch and the reishi, as well as the birch polypore, and certainly in chaga. Um, oyster mushrooms, you know, we have found in them, they have glucans in them, but they also have this naturally occurring form of a statin, uh, very similar to lovastatin, which is used to, uh, to treat uh, um, cholesterol um, and quite quite effectively in those people I know who use it them. 
Um, almost every mushroom, not almost, probably all mushrooms, have ergosterols in them that in our bodies get converted into vitamin D. So mushrooms are a great source of vitamin D. And we'll talk about the nerve growth stimulators more in heresium as we go down. And there's a bunch of kind of specific antimicrobial compounds in different mushrooms. <clears throat> so in the late 90s, early, early in this um, millennia, there was a great surge in, of interest in medicinal mushrooms. And a lot of the, in, the information was available um, to everybody to read. And then it kind of went underground as people started testing out um, and tracking specific licensed compounds. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But right now, particularly in other countries around the world, um, medicinal mushroom extracts have been approved for, um, for use in uh, therapies for cancer, um, in concert with radiation and chemotherapy, and sometimes alone, and certainly regularly used to uh, pr pr uh, reduce the, the chance of relapse in someone who has had cancer. Strongly used, and I strongly advocate for their use as a preventative, as a tonic or a, an immune stimulant. Um, and more and more people are using them um, for inflammatory illness, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, as we go along. And you know, none of them are approved as medicines in the, the United States. And so we're, our use of them is considered to be as dietary supplements. Um, and I, I'm going to reframe that and we'll call it functional food as we get, get into this. So some areas of active research around the country, some of it in this, in this uh, country, a lot of it in Korea and Japan and China. Um, you know, some of that in medicinal mushrooms to you to uh, address atherosclerosis or high cholesterol, the lipid, ba lipid balance. Um, there's some early uh, research in terms of use of some certain mushrooms in addressing diabetes, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and certainly cancer prevention and cancer treatment um, and anti-inflammatory. And the new thing that I think has got some real promise is some of the work with the heresium around nerve regeneration and cognitive decline. So I mentioned functional food and going way back to Hippocrates time, you know, his belief was to let medicine be our food and, to, and food be our medicine. And mushrooms fit really well into that. Uh, this photograph is not one of mine, but it comes out of Singapore um, and they celebrated at this exposition, the year of the dragon, by creating a dragon completely made out of reishi. And the as you'll see in the, on the mane and, and of this dragon, those long filamentous uh, reishi, uh, is, it's, it's regular reishi that is uh, um, fruited at high concentrations of CO2, which they call it the ant antler form. But anyway, beautiful. In terms of functional food, the, the definition of functional food is it's food that's meant to be eaten as part of a regular diet and it contains elements that enhance health or reduce risk. And there's people who say, you know, in my world, in my life, um, all mushrooms are functional food. Um, I did a, a, a large survey earlier this year, and I asked people, do you, you collect and use wild mushrooms for medicinals? Um, and there are a number of people who said, you know, I don't collect them specifically for medicinal use, but I eat mushrooms regularly because they're good for me and because I like them. So just so I'm going to go through some of the more common medicinal mushrooms in, in Maine and New England. Um, turkey tails we'll talk about as we go on I, that photographs up there just because it's so beautiful. And I want to start with some of the common ones that are both edible um, and quite, uh, quite highly valued as in terms of medicinal use. And Hen of the Woods or Mayataki um, is the second or third most popular uh, wild mushroom collected and eaten, in part because if you find it, you, it's easy to identify. It's large. Um, and if you find one fruiting, if you find one last fall or this coming fall, if you note where it is, it'll 
can come back in the same place for a long time. This is a fungus that um, causes heart rot in, in, in the trees that it, that it inhabits. Um, and usually it at least starts out on a living tree and will live on that tree without killing it. Um, I've got one that I have seen fruiting for more, well, more than 35 years. Most of the time we find it on oak trees, uh, red oaks up in, in, in central and northern Maine, white and red oaks further south in New England. I also see it um, on beech pretty regularly, uh, occasionally on ash, or let me say regularly on ash and occasionally on beech, and sometimes on other hardwoods. So it's a really versatile, excellent edible. It's also pretty highly regarded as medicinal. This is a perfect um, mature, but not over mature uh, myotake. Uh, it was growing at the base of a, of a red oak. Um, and you can see the kind of grayish color of the fronds. It's all one cluster together. And the color of it can really vary. Sometimes very dark, dark gray, almost coal gray, and sometimes very, very pale, uh, almost white occasionally. And that has to do with how much sunlight it receives as it's fruiting. You often find it just kind of nestled in against the edge of a, of a tree or within a, a foot of the trunk. Um, if you find it where there's no wood around, it means it's fruiting from a buried stump or buried roots. And medicinally, it contains a very broad variety of those glucans, beta glucans. Um, it's a really strong immune stimulator and modulator. Um, there have been some uh, extracts from um, myotaki that have been licensed and are being studied uh, uh, both in this country and abroad for use as a medication uh, for different kinds of cancers. Um, in this country, when they did the phase one clinical trials, which is a, uh, where they're testing a new potential compound or med medicine to see if it has any nasty side effects. Um, and one of the things they found out, well, they found out two things. One, they stopped the phase one trials pretty quickly because it was showing no problems at all. But the one thing they did see, that it slightly reduced the blood sugar um, in people taking it. Um, so now this, this is a, a mushroom that's being studied for its potential uh, in, in diabetes. Most people in this culture and with our eating habits run a little high with their blood glucose. So myotake is probably going to be good. If you tend to run low, uh, you might want to be careful about eating this mushroom. Um, I collect and, and use it and dry it uh, and freeze it uh, a lot every year and keep it on hand through the winter. Um, I went the wrong way. Here we go. Uh, the next group of mushrooms I'm going to talk about are the heresium. And I'm going to lump all three species that we have in New England together because in terms of their medicinal value and their edibility, um, they're really overlapping. So they're variously called, you know, lion's mane or comb tooth or bear's head tooth or bear's head hidden them. Um, and it really, it's a, it's a mass of teeth growing on the side of a tree. Pretty common, uh, mostly fall fruiting. Occasionally, occasionally, particularly at high elevations in cold areas, I'll see it fruiting in the early summer, but mostly it's September and October. Um, on beech, predominantly, secondarily on birch and maple. Um, and it's a sap robe. It'll rot the, the, the heartwood of a, a weakened tree, and it'll continue to grow on dead wood. Um, very easily identified. Usually it's the pure white you see in the top photograph, but sometimes when it's really young, particularly with the uh, um, Coralloides type, it comes out almost, almost salmon colored. And when it's young and firm like this, pure white, it's really an excellent edible. Um, I know some strict vegetarians and vegans who use this to, uh, as kind of a substitute for the shellfish that they used to enjoy. Very flavorful. This is a Coralloides that sometimes is quite highly branched. Um, in terms of the medicinal compounds, it contains a range of the glucans, um, so it does stimulate uh, our immune system. Um, and I've not seen any clinical trials with people, but it's pretty strongly anti-tumor in animal studies. 
The second part that it's really of interest is, is it stimulates the production of nerve growth factor. So it stimulates the production of nerves. So there's a lot of ongoing research, some early clinical trials that show it has some effectiveness with cognitive uh, dementia because um, it's able to act beyond the blood-brain barrier. So it's also been used to treat anxiety um, and depression, uh, particularly uh, was, this study was done with uh, menopausal and premenopausal women. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's got excellent uh, potential to keep our cognitive functioning sharp as we age. Um, the erinaceans and heronaceans are um, alcohol soluble, so it works really well in a tincture for preserving it. The next group, I'm gonna, we're gonna lump the oyster mushrooms together like the heresium. We have three really common species of oyster mushrooms in Maine and, and Northern New England. Um, and all of them are very aggressive rotters uh, uh, of the heart rot uh, in trees or deadwood. Um, they're common in this time of year right now, late spring, early summer, fruiting on aspens. Uh, my friend Michaeline found some last week, even as dry as it's been. Um, in midsummer, I find them really common on maple and beech, and the most heavy fruitings are like the ones you see in this photograph late fall. Um, usually in mid-coast area, about the last week or so of, of, of October and then into November. So this photograph here was taken in Hope um, some years ago um, in, I think it was like November 2nd. It's also a mushroom, if you're interested in cultivating, very, very, very easy to cultivate. So here's some that's in the prime eating stage. It's not fully expanded. It's a little firm and rounded yet. Got a nice flavor. Um, it takes well to a long, slow cooking. And there's one we find here in the midsummer, even in the hottest part of the summer, if we have rain. Um, Pleurotus pulmonarius, I call it the summer oyster because when it's found, mostly on maple and beech, um, the cap itself is somewhat thin flesh, but it has a very tough stipe, which I usually cut off. And for me, of the three oyster mushrooms we have, I think it has the best flavor. I really like it. And then the spring oyster, which is coming now, almost only on uh, aspen or popple, um, and you'll find it on dead wood or on branches, dead branches of, of large trees. Very, very common in the woods. Um, you may have to chase uh, the bugs to get ahead of them, but a nice edible. In terms of medicinal properties, again, um, oyster mushrooms contain some of those immune boosting anti-tumor glucans. In fact, there have been a couple of licensed compounds that have been tested um, for uh, anti-tumor work. Um, but also as a food, uh, it's really uh, been shown pretty effective for reducing cholesterol. Um, and that's from the, those uh, lovastatin-like uh, mevinolins. So glucans, the lovastatin, as well as uh, vitamin D. So now we're gonna move from those which are primarily edible mushrooms into those which are much less edible, but highly medicinal. Um, chaga is one that is almost grown to legend status in this part of the world. Um, and chaga is a parasite. It grows and should can be collected only from living trees. Um, primarily grows on birch, different birch species. Um, I find it uh, pretty commonly also on hop hornbeam. Um, and I've found it occasionally on other hardwood trees. It's uh, pretty common in Maine, and the further north and west you go in Maine, the more common it is. Um, it's pretty unmistakable, that very charred black outer color and the warm kind of yellow-brown interior. Um, so this is a, a sclerotium. It is not a fruiting body. So that mass that is the chaga is, is, the, is they call it structural hyphae. And the fruiting body, I didn't find it for years. Um, and it's not often seen, but I'm gonna show you a picture of one in a minute. 
So this is a great big old white um, birch that I, I have found. I keep watching it because when I found this, and this is some years ago, it was fruiting again, but you can see the scar around this opening says that before this chaga grew, there'd been another one there. And so long as the tree remains healthy, the chaga will rejuvenate. Um, so I collected that one and that goes back 12 years ago. And that tree is now, it's got a really large growth of chaga on it again. I've been leaving it alone. Um, but I, I, I just look at it every now and then. So here's the fruiting body. It's a strange little creature. So I'm going to, the picture on the left is, is a dead birch tree. And I saw it, uh, and I saw, it looked like it, the, the bark had been exploded out. So it was, and, and literally it had the fruiting part of the, of the mushroom grows underneath the bark and it expands out so that the bark fractures. And that allows the air currents in to spread the spores. Because the, the fruiting body is just these little bitty tubes. Um, and it's not very commonly found. Uh, if you find it, take pictures, because uh, very few people have ever seen this. So in terms of medicinal properties, chaga has been known and used by Siberians and Eurasians for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and they use it as a general tonic. Um, they use it strongly to treat uh, gastrointestinal problems, uh, both digestive problems as well as cancers. Um, I find it to be an excellent tonic. Um, it's got a range of glucans, which are a gentle immune stimulant. It also has a good range of terpenes, and I value those myself personally for their anti-inflammatory effects. My story with this mushroom is um, when I moved to Maine, I grew up in New Mexico. When I moved to Maine 40 years ago, I started catching bronchitis. And almost every year I would have bronchitis once or twice. And starting in the mid to about 2005, or a little earlier when I started using chaga, since then I've had a couple of mild cases of bronchitis and that's all. And, and it, because I use it as that anti-inflammatory and that gentle immune stimulant. Um, so this is a mushroom that's not edible, it's too tough, um, but it it's, makes a very flavorful tea. Now, this is the only, only medicinal mushroom that you should think about collecting in the winter or in, when it's not actively fruiting. Um, so this is a picture of chaga on the snow. Um, there's some areas where there's some ongoing um, research with chaga in terms of pain management and, and sy systemic inflammation um, and ongoing work with the tumor and infection protection. There have not been, that I have found, much in the way of clinical trials with humans. Some in, in Korea um, and, and Japan, but not much. So here we go deep into history with the uh, Ganoderma, Ganoderma tsuge, Ganoderma lucidum, um, also called reishi, or the tsuge is called red reishi, um, or ling shi. Uh, our common name is the hemlock varnish conch because when it's young and growing, it's got that beautiful varnish color to it. Um, here in Maine and New England, we find it most commonly growing on hemlocks. Um, uh, a weakened dying one or a recently dead one or a stump. Um, sometimes I find it on other conifers. I find it on spruce occasionally. Um, and it's a sap robe. It's doing that heart rot. Um, and what you want to look for is that shiny varnish conch. The fruiting bodies, they're just beginning to, to merge now in the end of, of, of May, early into June. Um, and in, in the wet periods of the summer, you may get some new ones going, but this is an annual fruiting body. It's an annual fruiting body, meaning that it's going to start growth now. And if it's starting now, it's going to mature in August or so and get, drop all of its spores. And by September, it's going to be starting to break down and dying. So you want to use it when it's fresh. So this mushroom is not considered edible, though when it's just emerging from the bark and it still hasn't gained the color, some people do, do eat it. Um, once it starts gaining color, it gets quite bitter from all those terpenes. 
Here's some growing on a, a hemlock stump outside of Camden. And there were about 30 fruiting bodies, um, anywhere from six inches to over 12 inches in diameter. And if you see them where the leading edge is still white, that means they're actively growing. It's not quite mature yet. It may start giving off spores then, but it still has some, some growth to go. Here's a range and you can see the range of, uh, of sizes that it matures. So even this youngest one here, it's pure red, it's pretty mature. And this large one, which is about 16 inches across, is still growing a little bit. Um, so very wide range of sizes. Um, and the medicinal properties, this is about as close as we get to a mushroom that's considered a panacea. Uh, in Japan and China, you know, I think they actually believe that it can housebreak your dog. And it's just, it's used for everything and it's got a lot of research behind it. Um, the tsuge we have here is taxonomically and very chemically um, similar to Ganoderma lucidum, which is the traditional reishi uh, of the East. Although we do have lucidum here occasionally on, on maple. So it's a real strong with immune enhancement and, and immune modulation. Um, a lot of use for anti-tumor, antiviral, antimicrobial. Um, it tends to boost uh, endurance. In fact, uh, some of the Chinese uh, Olympic teams have used Ganoderma to kind of boost their, their uh, performance. It's also been shown to lower, lower cholesterol. Um, I trust it very strongly as an anti-inflammatory and it's got some pretty strong antioxidant properties as well. So a lot of use. And how do you use it? Um, too bitter to eat, too tough to eat, uh, can make a very potent and strong tea. And if you drink a tea, a decoction of, of, of Ganoderma, you know it's medicine because it's, it's quite bitter. Uh, I very, hear very few people say, oh, I love that, um, compared to chaga, for instance. And very closely related in the same genus, but structurally much tougher, is the artist conch, uh, Ganoderma aplanatum. Aplanate means flat. And this is a really common perennial fruiting body. Um, on a big, old, um, dying maple tree, I have found them almost three feet in diameter. Um, very hard, very fibrous, very distinctive. Um, not edible, but, but highly prized medicinally. Now it's, it's a challenge to break it down because it's so tough and woody. And when I have used them medicinally, I never pick the big ones. I try and get them um, when they're young and or have been fast growing. And this is the species of tree that I target. Look at recently dead aspens. If you find a a grove of aspens that are getting a little mature where it's, they're thinning themselves out and overgrown, um, that's where you'll find very rapidly growing Ganoderma um, aplanatum that will only live a few years anyway. So that's, that's a good place to use them medicinally. So the medicinal problem is very similar, as I said, to, to reishi. Uh, large uh, range of glucans, as well as the very strong uh, terpenes, uh, uh, triterpenes with antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory effects. And you can see this is, this is one that's growing on one of those aspens. It grew very rapidly. In fact, after they put the shellfish uh, harvesting prohibited on there, the, uh, the shelf fungus grew and covered over the, uh, the poster. Uh, I love that uh, when I found that and took that picture. Again, if you can, and you may need to use a bandsaw to break this into small pieces or a, a heavy uh, um, cleaver, uh, but it makes a very potent bitter tea. I know a lot of people who will use a number of different medicinal mushrooms together to make a mixed, uh, mixed uh, immune broth to be used. And they call it the artist conch because it takes a very fine um, rendering and well, when it dries, <laughs> that color. And my friend Kendra Baver was made these a lot for a while. This is one of hers. So much less tough, um, but very, very common. I want to talk about turkey tail. So turkey tail is one of our 
very common leathery, small, annual fruiting body um, perennial polypore, or annual polypores. Um, it's called Trambatis versicolor because the color of the caps, as you'll see in these coming photographs, very much variable. But the underside is always pure white. It has a number of lookalikes, um, so you need to, to get comfortable learning it, and then you'll find it all over the place. It's usually, I begin seeing them sometimes the very end of July, but usually into August, and then peaking in September and early October. A very tough, too tough to be edible, um, but it makes a really wonderful broth. The broth that can be drunk a plain um, or to be used as part of a soup uh, or some added to something else. You can see the variation in color on these. And here's one where I've turned a couple of them over so you can see the very pure white underside. Um, and the pores on this are almost microscopic. You can just barely see them without a hand lens. Medicinally, you know, this is the mushroom worldwide that has by far the most clinical trials in terms of its use in, in cancer um, and in other immune stimulation uses. So back in the 70s, the Japanese um, initially uh, isolated a, a, a medicinal fraction of this, an extract that they call PSK, and they started doing the clinical work and, and marketing it. Um, shortly thereafter, the, ja the Chinese did the same thing. It's very similar, if not the same. They call it PSP. And both of them have been deeply studied and are used and licensed as anti-cancer medication in a number of Eastern countries. Um, and the sales, and this is old data, um, exceeded about $200 million a year in Japan uh, for its use. Um, it's available as a licensed compound in this country. Um, you know, on, as, as, a, uh, as a dietary aid, it's not, though it's been studied for use, it's not been approved by the FDA. Um, but we can collect it and use it as a, as a dietary aid anytime. I wanna give a, a, an acknowledgement to the Tinder Conquer Fomis Fomitarius um, because of its a really broad um, immune stimulation as well, and because it is one of the Iceman fungus. So it has those anti-tumor polysaccharides um, and pretty broad range of antimicrobial um, effect um, with bacteria and some anti-inflammation and pain relief effectiveness, at least with the alcohol ex extracts. I'm not sure about uh, decoctions for that. All right, so I'm gonna breathe a little bit and then I'm gonna dive into kind of the, the use of the hallucinogens as, 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 as medicinal aids. And in, in my work, I carry two hats when, I, when I'm dealing with the, the mushrooms that are hallucinogenic. And one of them is my concern about the misuse of them um, and, and therefore them as a toxin. And the other is the absolute deep interest in them as a uh, potential for, uh, for health benefits. And in this culture, East Western culture, we started to grow aware of them um, way back in, when Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll wrote that book. Because just before he, or while he was writing it, there was some reports of Amanita muscaria use coming out of Siberia. And so he said, one side will make you grow taller, the other side shorter. And Alice said, what, what side of what? The other side of what? She thought to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar. Ah, uh, Alice in Wonderland. So let's talk about the psychoactive fungi. There's two main groups, and I'm going to be dealing only with one. There's the psilocybin and the psilocin, the baocystin containing species, um, which I'm going to talk about in terms of their potential, and the ones that contain ibotenic acid and muscimol um, in some of the amanitas. I find them much more risky. I'm not gonna talk about them. And plus, they haven't had as much research in, term, in terms of their use for us. But the magic mushrooms, and they were, they're, they're called magic mushrooms based on an article that was written and, and published in, um, in Life magazine in the 1950s. 
So they have been used in cultures around the world far before we, there was written record of them. And we started learning about them in this country um, when Gordon Wasson, who was, you know, just a really rabid mushroomer, um, he started studying their use um, and he went down to visit a, a curandara in, in central and in southern Mexico. Um, and he started writing about it and the article in Life magazine excited a generation of people. There was a lot of research done in the late 1950s and 60s about their use across all kinds of things, use for um, mental health needs, youth, use in, in um, substance use, um, use as therapy aids for Jungian and, and uh, uh, Freudian therapies at that time. And some of the research uh, woke a generation to his recreational use. And Timothy Leary and some of his cohort out of, uh, out of uh, Harvard really started uh, pushing that in the mid-1960s. And it scared the bejesus out of the, um, uh, the structure of the society. And so starting in the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, it became um, illegal to use it. Um, and very difficult to do research. In fact, it was kind of the kiss of death for a researcher's reputation if they continued to use these in research. Um, but there was a resurgence, resurgence back in the late 1990s, a lot of it out of the um, John Hopkins uh, Medical School. And everybody around, around the world again are now looking very seriously at the use of psilocybin, psilocin, and some of the other um, hallucinogens uh, for their potential for therapeutic use. So we're going to talk about only the psilocybin-containing mushrooms. Um, and it's a class of compounds that are called indoles. Psilocybin and psilocin are closely related, and psilocybin in our bodies, in our stomachs, gets broken down into psilocin. Um, they're heat stable, they're water soluble. Um, if you ingest these, the symptoms typically start 30 minutes to 60 minutes and last four to five hours, and includes some hallucinations, that sense of euphoria, often a distorted sense of time, that time slows down. And what they're really famous for in terms of some of their use uh, spiritually as well as medicinally is that expansion of sense of self and that connection with a broader universe, that sense of oneness with that which is larger than us. There's a sense of an exhilaration and oh, by the way, they remain um, illegal to possess or use. So it's important to know that. You know, they're often referred to as the mushrooms that, that stain blue. And this is a psilo, psilocybin uh, cabecensis, and uh, you can see a little bit of that blue staining on those ones. So the psilocybin and psilocin are found in a number of different genera. I'm gonna talk about a couple of them which, which occur in Northern New England. Um, psilocybin cabecensis, I have found a couple of times um, I, don't, I think when I first found it, it had not been reported in Maine before, and it's obviously not very common, um, but there's a couple of others. Gymnopolis is very common. Um, some of the Paniolus and Pluteus are uh, not well understood in terms of their, their contents. Um, in terms of the potential benefits of this, the research is really strong, supporting that sense of spiritual connection. Um, the John Hopkins uh, research that was done in the late 1990s was a repeat of some work done at Harvard in the 60s. And it showed that, you know, even in under very, very closely controlled settings, a single dose, you know, and the, the long range of, um, effects of that are remarkable in terms of, of, of a person's connection with their world. Um, in a follow-up study from the 1960s one, you know, 15 to 20 years later, people were naming it as some of the most profound experiences they had in their lives. There's a lot of research now on its youth with, with anxiety and with treatment-resistant depression, um, some use around, as an aid around substance use uh, disorders, um, and it's long been recognized as, as very effective in terms of cluster headaches. 
Now, one of the things that was learned in the 60s before the recreational use got out of control, in some people's opinion, was the very, very careful attention to both the mind, mindset of the person taking them and the setting or the, the um, environment in which it's being taken. And so it needs to be a very supported and guided process. These are not mushrooms that I would recommend for just kind of going out partying recreational use. Because the downside of these is some people get, have that anxiety driven bad trip. If someone is vulnerable, if they already have anxiety, if they're in uncontrolled circumstances, that can be significant. It can trigger elevated temperature and convulsions, particularly in toddlers. I'm very young children, so I'm very much worried for them. Um, for adults, it's really more about that anxiety. And what I worry about as a, as a poison control identification consultant is how many people don't know what they're doing when they're out collecting them. And there are some really nasty uh, little brown mushrooms that are, that, that are sometimes mistaken. This is not my photograph here, the uh, Liberty Cap. Uh, they're probably in Maine. Uh, they're found pretty commonly in New Brunswick and in Nova Scotia. Um, but I've never found them. Again, the risk is uh, they're also illegal to possess and to use. There is a um, request into the FDA to change their characterization from something that is uh, uh, illegal to, uh, uh, to something which is uh, available by prescription. Uh, we'll see where that goes. And certainly the, the movie that was out this year, uh, Fantastic Fungi, has awakened so many people's interest in these mushrooms. Um, I'm looking forward to the possibility of them, them being used clinically more openly. And I'm sure there's questions of this coming up. So let me check my time here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about collecting. If you're going to collect mushrooms and use them medicinally, you want to use them when that species is optimum for, for collection and use, when their potential is the highest. So for reishi, you want to collect them and use them when they're starting to drop their spores, when they're starting to mature, not young and certainly not after they've died. Um, so use actively living, growing specimens. Annual means it can be only used that year when it's actively growing. Um, and if you're collecting them for use, only collect what you can preserve and use yourself. Don't waste them, and particularly chaga. If you find it, um, it's being actively over collected in, in much of this state, in much of this country. So be gentle with it. Um, and don't, don't do anything that will damage the tree when you're harvesting it. So for preserving it, particularly things like oyster mushrooms and mayatake, hen of the woods, when you find it, you may find 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds. Um, so you have to be sure if you're gonna collect that much, you wanna make sure you can preserve it. Refrigerate them as soon as you can because the glucans will break down without refrigeration over several days. Um, drying can preserve them quite well. Um, if you dry uh, oyster mushrooms, you know, make sure you hydrate them fully before you use them. Same way with Hen of the Woods. Um, it gets quite tough even when you rehydrate it, so I, I often will powder it. Uh, sauteing or cooking and freezing them is an excellent way for, for preserving them, as is uh, tincturing. Um, or some people will make those decoctions, those uh, concentrated uh, teas or decoctions, and then freeze that. Um, drying is really good for many of them. So how do you want to use them? Um, I strongly you know, believe in use as functional food um, as a dietary supplement. Uh, to support cancer therapy, um, I always strongly recommend use and, and confer with your medical provider openly about your use and the recommendations. There are some targeted chemotherapies that are contraindicated. Um, and use as a preventative, as a tonic to support your immune system, as I do that regularly. Um, my wife and I were diagnosed with COVID um, a couple months ago. And, you know, that impact to our systems and impact to our breathing um, 
We use chaga on a regular basis, three, four times a day, uh, both as ting and tinctures of reishi as a way to boost immunity as a, and also that anti-inflammatory um, because so much of the response with COVID is an inflammatory response. And I strongly advocate the use um, to maintain remission uh, after cancer treatment or prevention if you're at risk. So those that are used as food, um, I didn't talk about Flamulina volutipes. You can buy it and it's cultivated as in, in, in Okitaki. Um, it does uh, grow in Maine, not very commonly, usually late, late in the fall. Um, Head of the Woods oyster mushroom, shiitake. I didn't talk about it today because it's cultivated. It's a great edible with good uh, immune boosting potential. potential. And heresium, you know, it's a wonderful wild mushroom, but we can find it collect, uh, cultivated year round and easily cultivated. Um, so uh, your supply of it should be good throughout the year. And then decoctions. You know, by a decoction, I mean a hot water simmered stew or broth of the mushroom you're interested in. And you want the, the hot water that's simmered because that allows it to break down a little bit the glucans and make them available for you. If you just eat the mushrooms raw or lightly cooked, you're not gonna get many of the glucans. Broths work really way, well with turkey tails, dry hen of the woods, oyster mushrooms, lion's mane. And for more of a tea, not a broth, think of that as, as something for, for chaga, for reishi, for um, artist conch, for that group. And certainly, I'm not gonna talk about how to make the, the tinctures, but with, um, with mushrooms, you wanna use a double extraction tincture, which means you, you make a decoction and you do an alcohol tincture, and then you combine them together. Um, and you wanna look at what are the compounds you're wanting to maximize. Are they water soluble? Are they alcohol soluble? And for something like reishi, where it's both, or chaga, you want the, the double extraction can take care of them both. And you can buy the products as mycelial extracts or mycelium grown out on grain. Uh, some really good products use that, that technique. So I wanna talk just a little bit about resources for information and then get to questions. Um, my book, Mushrooms for Health, which is an excellent guide for collecting in, in the mushrooms in, in the Northeast. Um, it's no longer in print, but it certainly remains available on Kendall. Um, and though this is not, my second book is not focused on medicinal mushrooms, it does have a couple of chapters um, on the psychoactive mushrooms. Um, it is a really a good romp through the world of wild, edible, and, and uh, mushrooms in general. And it's available and in print, should be in some of the bookstores around here as well. And I'm going to be, you know, as depending on where this season goes, I've got a bunch of classes coming up. Um, I do a lot of day-long classes, um, and I'm doing them everywhere from Ellsworth to Rangeley to Jefferson Damascata, Freeport, Camden Rockport, Turner, um, mostly uh, scheduled in July, excuse me, in August and September, in early October. Um, I am going to be scheduling an advanced uh, bolete identification workshop um, if this year wakes up in terms of uh, our being able to associate personally. Um, and that's going to be a pop-up, so it'll be on, on short notice. The five-day Eagle Hill mushroom camp is, is not going to be held this year because of COVID. Um, and I'll be doing at least one medicinal mushroom workshop, um, probably a couple more, more day-long where we can get into preparation. And I want to acknowledge two resources in this state. One is the Northern England Poison Center. Uh, if you're concerned about uh, exposure, they're the people to call. Uh, they will call me afterwards, but reach out to them first. Um, and the Maine Mycological Association is a wonderful organization offering forays around the state. Um, and we do typically a couple of forays every, uh, every month. We're going to try a virtual foray on June 26th in that week leading up to it. But if you join, it's about $12 a year um, and you get to hang out with a bunch of people and learn mushrooming. And if you're gonna eat mushrooms, go slowly, be patient. A Couple of books, one I just wanna really acknowledge, uh, Medicinal Mushrooms, A Clinical Guide, Martin Powell's book from 2014 is a good resource. Um, check it out, um, 
It didn't go as deeply as I would have liked it to, but it's, it's a good, good, good resource. Fungal pharmacy um, is more historic uh, than it is a use guide. But if you go into the um, um, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, they, they have a really good resource uh, on both medicinal mushrooms as well as herbs and other traditional uh, medicines. They do a good job from a, from a traditional Western point of view. Uh, good resources there. So a very select partial resource. Um, don't hesitate. If you want to get on to my mailing list, uh, email me uh, and I'll let you know about future classes. Um, and more than anything else, I want to know, you know what your questions are. So I end this, you know, mushrooming for me is a way to, to touch my soul. So let the beauty you love be what you do. Uh, for me, mushrooming is it. There are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the earth. So with that, I'm going to stop the sharing um, and we'll take questions.